Hi, this presentation is going to walk through web forms for designers. My name is Jacob Rockwitz. I'm known as Jay Rockwitz on the web. I am a Drupal developer and software architect. I built and maintain the web form module for Drupal 8. So let's start with some web form basics. The web form module is a powerful and flexible open source form builder and submission manager for Drupal 8. The use case for the web form module is to build a form or copy a template Publish the form as a page note or block on your site. Collect some submissions, send out some confirmation and notification emails, review those results online, distribute those results as a CSV which you would download, or remote post them to a third-party server like a CRM. So let's do a demo of some web form basics. It's a clean install. Uh, the web form module includes a contact form by default. This is a contact form, your name, email, subject. For the demo, I'd like to add a company element to this form. So I go over to the form builder and I hit add element. And I select text field. And go in and say company. Scroll down. I'm not going to change any other settings. I hit save. Now let's look at the form. And company's out at the bottom. It should really say your company and come right after your name. So let, let's fix that. And instead of using the UI to drag and drop and then edit the element, I'm going to go over to the source tab, which shows you the source code behind the form. This is a very powerful feature for developers because it allows them to edit all the elements at once, to change all the labels. So if you want to review the editorial copy or make adjustments, so I'm taking the company element, moving it up, changing it to your company and making it required. I'm going to hit save. Now we'll go over to the test tab, which will show us the form and fill it out with reasonable default values, which are just Latin text, but you can see your company. I'm going to hit send. So in the background, two emails were sent out, a confirmation and a notification email. The message is displayed on the home page. Your message has been sent. So we've completed the part. We've built the form. We've collected the submission. So let's go back go over and look at the results. So we go over to the results tab and here's the, the single record we just created. We can click through, view it. You can even download this as a PDF which will display it online. I'm going to click back. I'm going to go back up to results. And now let's talk about exporting it, downloading it. So we go over to the download tab. Defaults to just generating a CSV comma delimited. What I'm going to do is switch it over to table and just note you could download all the submissions you've got generated as PDF documents. But for now, we'll do an HTML table. I'm not checking open the table in Excel because what this will do is it'll allow us to look at it on screen. We can control how this table is going to look, what elements are going to go into the table. But for now, we're going to uncheck this download export so we can just look at this table on screen. So I hit download and we've got all our data. And this would open in Excel and be styled the way you see it with a gray header. It's a pretty good demo of all you know the use case of the web form module from beginning to end of building a form to downloading a submission. And now let's start moving forward. And let's talk about just some general form concepts. I kind of want to introduce people to this concept that forms are conversations. It's a new concept that I've kind of been exploring. It's not new to anyone. Conversations is the oldest interface around. I, I find that a fascinating, fascinating statement that conversations were the first interface. That's how we communicated with each other. Um, and forms are, let's look at it. It's good forms ask the right questions which collect the best answers. And I think this is very relevant as voice user interfaces are, are becoming more popular and will progressively become part of what we're designing for. I'm, it's easy to predict that at least one third of our visitors to our site and our forms are going to be on voice interfaces in the near future. And you want to think about it, when you think about it as forms or conversations, you start thinking about questions. And the questions our forms ask. Who are you? What brought you here today? How can we help you? And then you go a step further and you start thinking, well, what's going to happen? Well, Alexa will probably take your form and say, You'll say, I'd like to schedule a doctor's appointment. And Alexa will interpret the appointment form and be like, is the appointment for you or someone else? This is just the tip of the iceberg. Um, I think having this context helps us because we just start thinking about, even like you think about a conversation. I like this. I didn't, I'm not going any further into this concept, but I, I, want, I like this slide because it shows kind of like there's 
two sides to a conversation. There's a there's lots of others too, but there's a productive conversation where you're listening and responding and collecting information. That's where it's successful. You stay on topic. You get you ask the right questions. You get the answers. It's also important because you have users and they're they're coming to your site that you have good conversations with them. Where it's a personal, thoughtful, and even empathetic that you understand them, what they're looking for from your organization. And conversations lead to experiences. People remember their, you know, their with your organization when they have a conversation, they remember it. That's their impression. Now, for design, I want to just bring us back down to user experience. That's, you know, what what encompasses everything you do to design a form properly and get it to work. It creates a user experience. And I'd like to break, you know, a forms user experience into these three dis design groupings, visual design, information design, and interactive. And visual design is, yeah, building attractive forms. I'm open to using the word pretty. Make a form attractive, appealing to fill out, visually easy to understand. And then that kind of leads to, when you start getting visually easy to understand, information design kicks in. You want to create understandable forms that people can get to and they know what's expected of them. And then interactive design is like this layer to make your forms usable, more usable. That could be how your validation works, how you respond to different, when people check off a certain box, do you give them a certain response? How do you interact with the user as they're filling out the form? And to understand the user experience, you want to ask questions. Who, you know, who are, who are they? Who are the users? What's their skill level? How much patience do they have? Uh, why are they filling out this form in the first place? And going, where are they filling out this form? Is it on a desktop, mobile? And I think what I'm getting at is in the next 10, 5 to 10 years, they're going to be sitting in the car filling out your form using a voice-activated device. So let's go to visual design. And visual design sets the tone of the conversation. How do we want users to feel when they fill, discover a form, fill it out, and complete it? And, you know, visual, good visual design starts the conversation. This is the first impression, period. That's the first thing people, they see it. This is their first impression. And you want to make sure it's pleasing for them to view the information. And to step back a little further, just be important. Visual design establishes an organization's brand. A form should reflect an organization. It should fit into the site should have their logo. If it's a personal organization, should have a picture of someone from customer service. You know, stepping back from that. And then the the, the other one, I, I, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on accessibility. Lots of presentations at different conferences are on accessibility, but visual design helps to ensure good form accessibility. I feel like visual designers are at the forefront of accessibility because they, if, if a visual designer doesn't care about accessibility, very few people are going to follow and care. And when I say accessibility, it's making sure the color contrasts are right, the font size is correct, it's readable, that people can visually understand the information. And to get everyone on the same page, it's important to have a style guide. And the web form module has an examples module which has a style guide, which is what scrolling through, where it just contains examples of every element so that it gets everyone on the same page. And style guides, you know, include all available elements, it lets you test the font size, style, and color. It's important to, like, this gives you, you can make sure all your design specifications are working. And, yeah, style guides confirm expectations. How is this, are your forms going to work? And, you know, the web form module distinguishes there's a style guide, which is a kitchen sink of everything, and then there's examples of just individual elements. When I say individual, it's like there's an example of input masks, and it just shows you how all input masks are going to work, or computed elements, how they work. And you got to explore elements and look at the inputs, simple text input options, which are just check boxes or select menus or radios. And in the similar grouping, there's buttons, which just provide a bigger visual indicator of, of someone to select an option. And there's also image selection, which in certain cases is really helpful to show an image. And you can even collect digital signatures. There's, I think, over 80 different elements available in the Webform module. And you just want to look at the style guide and get familiar with them and decide which ones you need to use. And just to 
get everyone on the same page, you know, element is anything that's displayed on a form. So it's anything. If it's a piece of text, that's an element. Inputs, it's an el an input is an element that collects a value. And a composite, which I'm introducing now, is just a collection of inputs used to collect a group of values. And then you can group inputs together and elements but within a container, just like here's a group of elements working together, and the example would be a details element or a field set, where you're just putting them, saying, here's a set of elements. And pages is what we use to create multi-step wizards, when you break up the form in individual pages. And types of inputs, you know, you have text fields, options, and we haven't done this, I'm not even going to explore this in this presentation, but file uploads, you get advanced widgets, which are just, you know, like ratings, signatures, phone numbers, email, and then there's also entity references, and since we're in the Drupal world, it's just important. It's a ability to, for example, have a drop-down menu show all the users on a site or all your events, and you're, you can reference them in your web forms. And moving to back to grouping, you can group elements using you know containers, sections, details, dividers, and layouts, multi multicom layout, which is Flexbox. Container is just a div wrapped around a bunch of elements. And a section really is the div with a header, with a section tag. That's important for accessibility. So it wraps in semantic markup to say this is a section of the page. A field set is a group of elements. Details is the same kind of a group of elements, but it's collapsible. So you can open and close. You can even have it conditionally open and close. Flexbox is just how the web form module allows you to do multi-column layouts. And before I get into demoing, I kind of need to step back even further and be like, every single element supports custom CSS classes, styles, and attributes. And classes are just reusable classes from your theme that you can plug into any element, anything on a form and be like, hey, I want to tweak this with this class. Make this a big button. Make this a big text field. Whatever you can think of is possible. And then you can even go a step further on an individual form tweak minor pieces of the layout and the look and feel. An example would be sometimes you just have to add a little extra margin to an element before or after, or even remove a little extra margin. And then attributes just allow you to add advanced HTML attributes that might be missing from the UI or even tracking codes to your elements. I'm going to demo layout and styles. We're going to go back to our form. So we're here, but let's jump out all the way up. Let's look at the form again so we are all on the same page. I would like to put your name and your company in a two-column layout. So I'm going to go over here. I'm going to hit Add Layout. I'm going to hit Save. I'm going to bring it up here. And because it's a container, we have to put your name and your company below it. And let's look at it. There we go. By the way, when you're building forms, it's a lot of back and forth. Because now I'd like to add a little horizontal rule because I like that visual element. So if I type horizontal rule, and this is an example where classes do kick in. So here's a horizontal rule. Now we go to the attributes and I go to classes. I have these horizontal rule classes. I go to the fanciest one, the glyph. And I'll hit save. I'm going to move it up below our flex box. I'm going to create a visual separation. Oop, I grabbed the wrong thing. Look at that mistake. I moved the buttons up, which is not a big deal. It's easy to fix. That's why you go back and forth. So you go like this, bring it back down. It looks good. And now just to show you kind of like adding style. So let's say I want to really call this out. I want to put a border around it. I'm going to go over here and go over to the Flexbox container. I'm going to go over to Advanced. Now we can enter in custom classes. So I could wrap this in an error message because that's the default. We're in the Bardic theme. We don't have a huge design system available to us. But I could say make it red, you know, red, yellow, green. But I'm going to go into styles and I'm going to do, let's see, I'm going to add a border. I'm going to say 10 pixels, solid, blue, and add a little padding. And you can do this in your classes. I just wanted to kind of illustrate it here. I'm going to hit save. Boom, we've just called it out a little bit more. And anything is possible here. Um, let's move forward, and I think I want to emphasize, you need to explore and experiment. You can do anything you want visually with the web form module. It really comes down to your 
design system, your theme. When I say design, how you're organizing your form elements. What, what are your specifications on how you visually want them to look? So moving on to information design, information design establishes the topic of the conversation. What are you talking about when someone gets to a form? What's going on? They've said, oh, this looks pretty. Then they start reading it. And this is where the questions kick in. What are the questions we need to ask? And how should they be answered? That's what information design is. What, what's, what are we after? What's the questions? And good information design makes it easy to understand information. What's going on? What? And I think these two are hand in hand. Sets the expectations. Someone should be able to look at the information and say, okay, this, they want my contact information. They want my medical history. And if they do, okay, that's an expectation. Do I have that available? And, and I also think it's important to provide explanations when you're setting, when you're saying, give us your, med like, I'm, I come from a healthcare background, so I'm talking in terms of you know, medical history. Well, why do you need, why do you need someone's medical history? Well, we need it to give you better care. Um, and so some concrete examples, you can provide explanations using titles, placeholders, descriptions, more and help. This is an animated GIF of the kitchen sink of all the different widgets available to every single element in the web form module. Don't do this. Don't use every single one. But what you are seeing is you can add a simple title or you can have a little question mark that opens up a little tooltip. You can have placeholder text. You can have a description and then you can have this more slide out. It's a lot going on. So let me explain a little bit more about it. And just like placeholders just provide a little guidance. They, they should not replace labels. You should have a title. It just helps enter your, you know, you could just give an example of a phone number. Enter, you know, you say phone number and the placeholder might be, you know, parentheses 999, close parentheses 999 dash 999. You get the idea. Descriptions, you know, go right below text elements. You can put them before too and they provide you a little extra information. The more link provides a lot of extra information. My best example with the more link is um, I've had forms where we're collecting medical information. We asked for a PSA. Uh, it's a, I don't even know what PSA is. I forget what it stands for. But the real point of it is we say PSA. Most people know what a PSA is, but we really do need to provide a two-paragraph description on what is a PSA and how do you get it. And that's where we use a more link. So it says PSA, has an input, and then it says learn more about your PSA. And it's a little slide-out link, and they click and it gives them two paragraphs about it. And tooltips are like more links because you can, but you can provide information in tight spaces. I'm going to completely contradict myself here because I'm going to be like, don't use tooltips, but I use them all the time in the web form module. And there's a reason why I use them in the web form module because the use case is people are going to continually come back to the forms that are in the web form module to build a form. And there's a lot of help I want to give them, but I don't want it to take up a lot of screen real estate. They only need to see that help once and sometimes never. Or if they get frustrated, they can go to the tooltip and get a little extra help. And it's my way to kind of save a little space while providing a lot of information. It's a very, I would only use tooltips like on forms that people keep coming back to where you, you just want to make sure there's a little extra tip there. If it's a login, sometimes you might want to put a tip in, but sometimes it's better to be direct. Just show them the description. Tell them what they need to know. And you can also set expectations using messages. The web form module supports inline messages. This is, you can, as an information designer, say, I want to put a message here. I want to warn people about this section and say, hey, this is really important information. You must fill this out. And this is why, and I want you to understand it. And, you know, they provide explanations. You can use them to prevent unexpected errors. You can warn people, especially like so, they can be displayed on conditional logic. If someone fills out a certain set of inputs that they will not be able to complete a form or there's something else they need to do, you can display a message to them. And say, hey, uh, you got to give us some more information. And messages in the web form module support the ability to close them, which is very nice. If you have a form that people are going to keep going back to, you could have a message at the top that they can close. They can say, I don't need to see this anymore. I use this all the time in the web form module. I will tell people about security implications to file uploads and say, hey, be aware, don't let anonymous users upload files. I'm assuming they read it and they can close it if they don't need the information anymore. 
So also you can organize, so we're switching gears to elements, you can organize complex information using composite elements. So this is an address composite element, and it's just a group of elements working together. And it standardizes the collection of data. So you are created this read as well. This is, for an organization, it's kind of powerful. This is what we define an address to be, period. This is, across all our forms, this is an address. This is... These are the field, these are the elements, this is the description, this is, we're gonna, we're gonna capitalize ZIP and zip code, or we're not. Very powerful, and it's reusable across multiple forms. And lastly, you know, it's important, you know, validation errors. This is a very important part of information design. How are you going to, what's required, what's not required? What's the message you might wanna display for required inputs? Sometimes the default it, that this is required, this email is required is not enough. You might want to say email is required because we want to be able to reach out to you. Depends. You can also put pattern regular expressions into your validation so you can validate the values and make sure the in, how, you're getting the best answer by saying you have to enter a phone number in this format. You put validation on it and say, well, you didn't enter it in that format. Or you try to give them an input mask to help them. And there's counters. How many characters? How many words? Some tips. I feel like this is a no-brainer for people, but they forget it sometimes. Always put required inputs before optional. Even grouping. It is really smart to group ready your contact information, and that's all required, and then additional information, and none of it's required. It creates one of the easiest user exp it explains to someone exactly what they need. They look at group one, they say, ah, I got to fill all that out. Group two, well, it says additional and nothing's required. And they're like, boom, okay, now I know. Maybe they'll fill it out, maybe they won't. The goal is to get them to fill out the form. You definitely want to establish patterns for desired values. Having a style guide that says, this is the how we're going to do phone numbers, how we're going to do email addresses, what explanations, makes a big difference. And you can use conditional logic to show or require inputs. So you can decide, well, if they entered this piece of information, now I need to require this element or even show it to them. You can hide things. Who are you? If you're, in my case, if you're a patient, we need your patient information. If you're a caregiver, we need the caregiver's information and the patient information. That's conditional logic. You ask, who are you? But let's go to composites because I think they're really important. And in, we can go with this form. So these are individual, your name and your company. I want to collect more information. Instead of going in here and adding all the individual elements, I'm going to delete this. I'm going to keep the horizontal rule. I'm going to add a contact composite. Oops, sorry about the typo. Ooh, double typos. Click. So we're going to call it contact. And then you see you have your name. We're going to go back to requiring it. Company will require. Email, I'm actually going to take it out because we have an email in the form and I want to. I don't want to break any of the back-end logic right now. But we're getting phone number, address, city state. You can go and tweak these. You can change the labels, placeholders, help text. You get the idea. I don't want to go through all of these. But let's go down and just hit. You can also say how you want it to be laid out. If, if you use Flexbox anywhere in the form, the address element will use Flexbox. If you don't, it won't. I'm going to say yes so we can just see how that looks. I'm going to keep going. It's here. I'm going to move it up here. Hit save. Go to the test tab and let it fill out. And there's name company, but now we've got all this extra information being filled out. And then we can, they can continue with the form. And you could go in and change these to be your name and your company. It's a very simple example. T to just emphasize why composites are so valuable is you can build custom composites. Your developers can go in and build anything to your specification and make this reusable piece of this input. And it makes for large organizations, if you have 100 forms, this could save a huge amount of time and data integrity. You know it's going to be the same across all forms. So let's keep going. Okay, so this slide is completely out of place. I, we're in the middle of the presentation, and I'm not going to go into analytics, user testing, and A-B testing, but the, thing, the reason I'm doing this is I'm showing you a ton of things going on. Display messages, display labels, have more help. 
you need to test these things. You need to build a baseline, get data, make sure people are completing the form. You can get feedback from your users. I think A-B testing is so valuable with forms. And A-B is just you create two versions. You have your original version of the form and then your enhanced, your assumption that, well, I'll make this change and it will be better. And then you run tests and see if your completion rates are actually better on the new form, the B version. And then you go with the B version. Easily the easiest way to build the most usable forms and, and really to show your, frankly, to show your boss, this is worth doing. If or you learn, you know, learn from your mistakes. You're like, oh, it's not worth changing this. Um, just keep it in mind. We're going to now, because also the user test, you get into interactive design, which is, you know, interactive design designs the process of the conversation. This gets complex, and you want to have stats about it. Because how are we going to ask and respond to questions and answers? It's a lot more nuanced. What's going to happen? You know, the goal is to make it easier to enter information and respond to the user's interaction. When they check something, is there something we need to do? Should we display an error? And I do think the, the goal is to prevent errors, to make it easy for someone to fill out a form, to make it clear, you know, help them. And you can improve the user experience by adjusting the form behaviors. The web form module, I mean, it's almost a dozen different settings you can do to tweak the form. And some of these are on by default and some are off. And I'll, it's hard to see this screen, so I included a couple. This is an incredibly powerful feature because you can pre-populate elements through query string parameters. Going back to my example of like healthcare, if we have an appointment request form for pediatrics, adult patients or referring physicians, and the first question is, who are you? Are you an adult patient? Do you have a child or are you a referring physician? You can, you know, we know where they are on the site. They might be in the pediatric section of the site and they go to request an appointment. When they click that request an appointment link that opens the form, in a query string parameter, you could pass in, who are they, pediatric patient, and fill it out. Fill out the element, make their life a little easier. And moving on, you can warn users, this is a, a really nice feature. If you have really long forms and they go to accidentally hit the back button, you can warn them about unsafe changes. Not something we turn on by default because it's a little too aggressive, but if you have long forms, an application will definitely turn that on. You can also prevent duplicate submissions. If you know users should never submit a form twice, it's a good box to check. So, you know, in the usability world on forms, it's back and forth on whether you want to display a required indicator or not. That is tricky. That's the red asterisk. And at the top, you have a red asterisk that says indicates required. I th it depends on the form, depends on the user experience. Auto focus the first element. I, I included it because it's a really juicy nuance. So this idea that, ready, if someone's filling out a form multiple times, the goal is to reduce the number of clicks. And if you know when they navigate to the form, they must go to the first element, auto focusing it just saves them a little time. It makes it a little easier for them to fill out the form. Not something we could assume on all forms, but certain forms it definitely helps. And similar to, you know, behavior, you want to respond to interaction by leveraging conditional logic. So you can set whether things are visible or required if they enter in an email address. Or if they enter in a Gmail address, you might say, oh, we don't like Gmail addresses. I mean, there's tons of possibilities. And some tips with conditional logic, I, I see people forgetting this. If a condition needs to apply to a group of elements, put them in a container, because then you can apply the conditional logic to the container and not each individual element and you can hide and show that entire container. This is a really powerful concept. Hidden elements can trigger conditions. So you could have, this is like um, these two bullet points kind of work together. You can have a hidden input that's who are they, and it's passed through the query string parameter. When it's set, it triggers conditional logic on the page, which will hide and show different elements. Users don't even know that conditional logic's happening. They get to the form and it's slightly different because we knew some information about them. And I do want to point out, moving on, you know, you can use patterns for multiple values. So patterns are regular expressions. So you can kind of say, if they enter this value or these values, hide and show this element. And there's some advanced elements where you can set expectations using input mass. How do we want them to enter a phone number? You can have counters to tell them how many words they can enter. For 
another approach to phone numbers is use the international phone number input and it specifies the format, lets them pick their flag, it provides a nicer, this is an interesting one because it provides a more visual user experience. I like this. If you have an international form and you want people to understand you are an international organization, this user experience drives that home. Because it's not just a text box, it's we understand you're from all these different nationalities. And then a classic one is select menus, multiple selects. Don't work so well, there's some usability issues, so you, there's enhancements where you can apply a select to, to it, and then you get nice little tagging system. So some advanced element tips and tricks. They, they use them to improve the user experience. I don't didn't include an example, but the image select is really powerful. That makes a big difference in user experience. If you're telling someone pick the type of door you want, showing them the type of door, I'm giving you a real abstract example here, but that helps. And you can provide better visual cues. A rating element really is just numeric element one to five or a drop down one to five, but instead you're showing five stars that they can check off. It's a better visual cue. And then you can also get better data. You know, having a date picker, having a phone number widget, having email, where you can just use these advanced elements to get better data. And this is the second time I bring up accessibility. Watch out for accessibility issues. I, I struggle with this all the time. So right now, the state select two, when I say select two, it's like these, there's the third party libraries that will enhance a drop down menu to make it work better for multiple values. But, and I, I, Webform supports three. I just want to have select two, chosen, and choices now. And all three of these libraries visually make it easier for a fully capable user to fill out the form, but for people with disabilities, it can make it harder. And the entire online community is struggling with this. How do we make things better while still accessible? Just pay attention to this. Don't ignore accessibility. Now, this is a juicy one. This is going to be a good demo. Experiment with modal dialogues and multi-step forms. These are really advanced interactive patterns. I think people are familiar with multi-step. That's where you break it up into pages. But modal dialogues are really powerful because users could be anywhere on your site and they click and they get right to the form. They don't have to navigate to a new page. And, you know, modals and multi-steps, you know, they reduce information overload. You don't have to have the form on every page. They click a link. You know, Wizard supports saving and resuming. And Ajax helps just in improve the responsiveness, the feel of a form. They don't have to keep hitting the, refreshing the page. And the demo, this is a very juicy demo before I start. So multi-step and dialogues. So what we're going to do, we're going to take this and make it a multi-step form. And by the way, this does start to feel overwhelming. So we're going to go in here. We're going to go over the build tab. I'm going to do a couple of quick things. I am going to take out this horizontal rule. Doesn't seem necessary on the multi-step. We're going to add pages. We're going to add contact. Now, I know I have an element called contact, so I have to change this to be contact page. I'm not going to change anything else. That's page one. I'm going to add another page. And we're going to call it message. We also have a message element, so we're going to call it message page. We're going to do show columns so we see what's going on. We're going to nest a contact under the contact page. We're going to enter the, and we'll even put email under contact and we're going to nest the subject and the message. We're going to hit save element. We have a two part form. You can see contact email. I'm going to add a, do a couple more enhancements just to show you the power here. So when you're design, thinking about your, your interactive design, how these multi-step forms going to work, Let's go in and go over to the form. And we've got behavior. By the way, the behaviors tab we talked about, I'll just show it to you so we're on the same page. But let's make a preview optional. You can change the labels. You can add custom messages. That's pretty much it. You can also go in and change the, the whole wizard. You can say what the progress is, the percentage. All this depends on your forms. Now let's leave it at the default. Hit save. 
I just want to show you that there's a preview tab now. Boom. Now, someone could come to this. It could get slightly overwhelming. So let's do it. Okay. We've created a multi step form. How do we insert this in the modal dialog? This gets into like we're going to jump to some advanced stuff, but let's go over. Sorry to jump around already. I'm jumping to the main web form admin page. I'm going into configuration. There's at the bottom, I'm going to make this a little smaller so that it lines up. I'm going to collapse this. We're on form settings across the whole site. There's a modal dialog setting, form dialogs. Now these are the default dialogs. I'm not changing them. There's a little checkbox here. And then, by the way, there's a dedicated screencast for this. And what this does is if I enable site-wide modals, it inserts the modal dialog JavaScript across your whole site. Not something we can do by default. By the way, this is a great example of a collapsible. You know, it's just giving you a hint to add the dialog class. You might want to use one of these libraries. For now, I can do this without. I'm going to hit save. I've enabled modal dialogs. I'm going to go back up to the contact forms. I'm clicking on web forms, contact, settings. I'm slowing down because I know this is a lot. I'm going to hit collapse all. We're on the general tab and now we have dialog settings. Here are our dialogues, and we can test them from here. If I test normal, you've got the multi-step form. We're going to get a validation error. Let's start to get the idea. Now, we want to insert this on the site. So there's example snippets of how to insert it. This is some HTML markup that as long as your text format supports classes, those two classes, Webform Dialog and Webform Dialog Normal, and really I'm just making it look like a button, um, will trigger it. I to do this demo, I'm going to go over to the block system. I'm going to go over. We're getting to a. I like doing some more involved stuff because it helps you understand it. Let's do. We're going to add a custom block. We're going to call it contact. We're going to switch it to full HTML. We're going to go over to source. We're going to put this in. And there's a little button. We'll keep it. Let's keep it this way. It's all staying there. Now we'll go down, hit save. So I've created a little snippet of content that we can insert anywhere on our site. And now I'm going to go down to the footer. Here, we'll add it right here. Not the best demo, but let's say we have contact. There's our custom block. We're going to place it. That's it. Just placing it. I'm not even going to try to make this look pretty. Huh? This is more about, there it is. Hit save. Now I can go back to the site. Okay, so we're on the form, so it remembered where we were. Oh, look, there's a little UX issue, but I think that's fine. On the home page, and think about this, you could add this button or link anywhere. We're scrolling down, and there's a little widget, and boom, there's our UX. On our site, Bardic theme. You can design this dialog to your heart's content. I'll fill it out. Preview. There's the preview. Hit send message. And it redirects to the home page. This is a pretty valid user experience for a contact form. We don't need people to navigate to a contact form on your site. You still have to, you know, you still want to have it in case someone searches for it. But when they click contact, by not making them leave the page or go to a new page, because I mean, you don't have to do it this way, they can stay on the same page. It it's just a better user experience. You've opened a dialogue and said, okay, I'm listening. Tell me, I like modal dialogue. Forms and modals, to me, say the first, the most important thing is we're listening because there's nothing else around. Here's your task. We want you to complete this form. You told us you want to give a contact us. We're listening. Um, I hope that, I don't know, I, I think I brought it back to the importance of conversations. And you want to think about the design of your forms and create a user experience where you're listening to people. And this is an interesting takeaway because I've just showed you one of the most complex user patterns in the web form module, and I'm saying keep it simple. I don't forget that people want simplicity. They want, and, and it's so our, it's once again a contradiction because the web form module is a pretty complex module in user experience as a site builder. It has every piece of functionality that you could possibly imagine. The goal is not to build complex forms. It's to build the right form for the right use case. And you want the simplest one. You 
wanted to make it easy for someone to understand, fill out and complete. So some more information about me. I have a blog, jrockwoods.com, drupal.org, catch me on Twitter. The web form module has a lot of documentation. There are screencasts, I think we're up to 40 different screencasts, including this one will be listed there. You can go on Drupal Answers to ask questions. You can go to the issue queue if you find a bug. And I do want to take a moment and make a pitch for the web form modules Open Collective. And what Open Collective is, is it allows open source projects to transparently collect and distribute funds. It's a way to help get you to support the web form module by giving us a little money, like giving the web form module a little money to show some appreciation, to help us. The logo that you, you see on the web form module landing page was paid for by Open Collective. I'm working towards if someone finds an issue security related to give them a $50 thank you for going to conferences to try offset some travel costs, maybe even get some professional accessibility review, and maybe to improve support. And there's just a lot more to come. Uh, I think you should get involved. Learn more about me at jrockwoods.com. And thank you.